we're super happy to have you. Thanks for dropping in on our webinar this evening. And uh, we are having a lot of good stuff coming your way. We're just discussing the weather in Los Angeles. I went there last week, visited um, the Burbank office of Skahoy, where we have Tyler and Grant and Sherry sitting. So that was um, an exciting time. I, um, for the first time, had to enjoy and figure out how LA was in, in uh, December. I, I never saw that before. And I think um, they had a, a wonderful approach to celebrating Christmas with sunshine outside uh, and high mm -hmm. temperatures, which is not what you have in Denmark. There you preferably have snow or you just have like, you know, chilly autumn with rain. Um, I got winter tires on my car also now. So once again, I'm fully ready. Um, this webinar is a um, co-hosted stream with Red, and it's super exciting having a chance to um, to be on a webinar with Red. I think it has been a dream for many years for for Skahoy, and we also have something really powerful. Um, the the uh, combination of our RCP controller and the Red Komodo and the V Raptor cameras we are going to show you tonight. Um, giving you a whole new way of exploiting or um, using your cameras in workflows that are more broadcast-like. And we will unpack that for you during this webinar. So uh, I want to um, to uh, let James introduce himself. James, welcome to, to our webinar. Tell us a little bit about hey. who you are. Thanks, Casper. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm the uh, Global Sales and Education Manager here at RED. I've been with RED for a little over 10 years now. Um, I do own one of these uh, beautiful 8K cameras, and I think that when you talk about cameras, plural, right, we need them to match and we need them to be all on the same page. And that's kind of where we are today here. We have the Komodo camera, which I'm going to go ahead and hold up, which is our smallest form factor camera here. And I think this is one that for a lot of the cinematographers out there that have been promising themselves a camera that they could own, uh, that Komodo would be that first camera that's uh, probably the least uh, cost of entry to get into RED, but all of the benefits of utilizing RED code and the wireless capabilities. And then you also have our brand new V Raptor right here, and I have one as well. And I believe I saw one in your desk as well, Casper. So the V Raptor is our new flagship camera, and we're really excited to be able to show you how Scarhoy can work with all of our camera systems today. So thank you again for having us. Thank you very much, James. And that's true. We have the, both cameras to uh, to demonstrate. That's that's exciting. So uh, I'm Casper mm -hmm. Skahoy. I'm the CI CEO of uh, Skahoy and um, founder and so on. Um, we we also want to give you a little bit of history of uh, who we are in case you don't know either of our companies. So uh, James, would you mind to uh, to tell us a little bit about Red's history? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, well, you know, Red started uh, back in 1999, I want to say, when it was originally incorporated. And Jim Gennard, the creator of Oakley Sunglasses, um, not many people know this, but he was a very, very big uh, film and photography buff. He actually is one of the largest private camera owner collectors. And uh, when he uh, sold Oakley and started Red, it was mainly focusing on creating the best camera system in the world. He wanted a video camera that also took stills, and he started that focus on 4K, and that was kind of what started the revolution that was Red. Now, going all the way back to the Red One, which was a 4.5K camera that used, utilized Red code to brand new cameras like the V-Raptor today, I think the really impressive thing here is you still have that impressive look, that flexibility of working with 16-bit raw imagery, and you also have the benefit with now with Raptor and Komodo, both a high frame rate option, because Raptor will do 8K up to 120 frames per second, and then Komodo, which is a global shutter camera, not quite high frame rate, but gives you that option to work with a small, compact form factor camera that also has that same dynamic range of benefit and color accuracy. Very nice. And, uh, so, <laughs> sorry, James. No, that was good. That was perfect. All right. Um, yeah, uh, Skahoy, if, if you are new to Skahoy, you, you may have come to this webinar because you know Red and you're excited about what Skahoy could do with these cameras to enable broadcast workflows. We are a company who uh, specialize in broadcast controls of all kinds of sorts or media production control, more specifically live production very often. This is why we will be looking at an RCP today. And uh, my history with this also runs back. I really like, James, how you are referring to your ambition to create the best cameras. I am, um, our company have a vision to invent the future of life production control. So we are also very ambitious about our technologies and we always look at ourselves as 
on the way to this. And today I will present a brand new platform we've been working on during the whole Corona time. And it has been a dream of mine come true that we can now finally begin to ship it. And I also know how exciting 22 is going to be because there's so much in the pipeline here to achieve our vision. So we have been in business for like 10 years and um, have uh, also grown quite significantly. So we are like 30 people today uh, spread across the world. We have a Burbank office. We have Thailand Grant um, available here on the webinar today from Burbank in LA. Otherwise, we are located in Copenhagen. This is why I have a funny accent because I'm a Danish guy, if you didn't know. So um, we have a poll for you to open up the webinar. Tyler? Yeah, guys. So we have a couple questions. Question one is, have you worked with Scarhoy products before? Question two, are you a current Red owner? Number three, what is your background, cinema, broadcast, AV, or all of the above? Or, and how would you describe yourself as an end user, a reseller, or just somebody who's other, interested in our products? Awesome. Now, what we did not coordinate as far as I know before the show is if we should wait for the answers or if we should just move on and get back to the answers later. What do you think, Tyler? I think that you guys should go on and start and we'll get back to the poll when we All start right. the Q&A. So do you have a little bell you can ring to get our attention? Because I think James and I will get caught up in our presentations very soon and quickly. Uh, I don't know if I have a bell. I can just yell at you though. That's yeah, yeah, what, please do, please do. do that. Yeah. I think you need Yell to get or back some to me. Waves. For... That'll work. <laughs> yeah. Um, Casper just did a wonderful job pointing out that he has some associates in the chat. Uh, we also have some red associates in the chat. I have both um, Frank and Matthew from our end. And those can be simple things like I know I just rambled off a bunch of camera names there. And, you know, Komodo, Raptor, DSMC2, DSMC3. If we ever say an acronym and you don't quite know what it is, please feel free to reach out to us. We have a number of resources, not just in this webinar, but also on red.com's learn page. And I think that's really the main thing with, with, with working with Red is being able to, regardless of where you got into the camera system, right? One of those questions were, if you do own a Red, and I'm also talking to customers that maybe don't own a Red yet, the beauty is, is wherever you wanna jump into the system, if you have, a, if you have an affinity for gorgeous images and you want to shoot things in a higher resolution or maybe in more slow motion, I think that's why you maybe are initially interested in RED. And then now when we can talk about multi-camera control, uh, network control, wireless control, live streaming, I think that's where it really expands uh, where are the capabilities of the RED camera system. Here's the Komodo and I'm going to hold up here a Raptor as well. And, and just look at those extremely small form factors here, right? The camera is pretty much all inclusive and you can see the big wireless antennas there that I've got the slightly larger antennas here to increase that Wi-Fi range. But that Wi-Fi range is something that you're not just limited to the Wi-Fi that comes out of the camera. You have several different modes, including the ad hoc mode, which is kind of like creating a hotspot on your phone and you're creating the wireless live stream directly out of the camera. And then the other option is what you're seeing here, right? I have a ethernet cable plugged into the Raptor. And I, I don't wanna say why that's plugged in, we'll save that for the end. I think that's the real benefit of working with these camera systems. If you wanna work with something like uh, an iPhone, uh, Android device, an iPad, notice I'm using my phone right here in the middle of the live stream to control the camera. However, if I wanted to switch my view because I don't wanna give up my, uh, if I don't wanna give up my phone or maybe I didn't bring my iPad, look what I'm gonna go ahead and show you here. I'm gonna to switch to my desktop here, and what you are seeing is the live image coming right out of my Raptor camera right there. And maybe Tyler, a director of photography in Burbank, and he wants to double check that I have at least a good exposure here, and watch what I'm gonna go ahead and do. I'm gonna turn on my false color, and you guys should be seeing that on your end. I can see that a Caucasian skin tone is a nice pink and green, which I can see right here clearly. And maybe it wasn't quite at that nice exposure. Maybe it was something a little bit darker like this, and I'm purposely making this image darker. And that's where maybe it's a little bit underexposed. What Watch what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna go ahead and use the same laptop that I'm using. I'm gonna delete this dot .9090 right here. And look what I'm gonna go ahead and do. This is now that same live live stream coming out of the camera but now I have all of the camera control and I can say, you know what guys and gals, we should have been at an F4. 
or mm -hmm. maybe we didn't want that 3D LUT on that you have turned on here, I'm toggling that all on and off. And once we get back to an image that we're happy with, I'm going to go ahead and re-add in that port 9090. And now you're looking at that same live image again. And I'm going to switch back here to my camera live because I really just wanted to emphasize that when we are in this COVID world, when we are trying to keep productions going, I now have the ability to check your shot, make sure you're in the proper framing, that you have the proper settings within your camera. We're going to talk about some expanded capabilities today here um, once we uh, get Casper and everyone back on and uh, talk about some of the benefits here of working with Blue Pill and with Scarhoy's wonderful controllers. Thank you, James. You uh, did a wonderful job and uh, we're super excited to hear more later. Um, so. I would like to tell you about Blue Pill Platform and the RCP Pro V2. Uh, so actually it's not V2, but um, today the setup we are presenting to you is a red Komodo camera over here. We have a V Raptor right here and the RCP Pro brand new product from Skahoy and it has a new platform inside. We call it Blue Pill. And the reason why it's called Blue Pill is because it actually primarily exists as an external device. If you know anything about our products, you know we have like a 40 plus minus products in our range. We have different form factors because you guys need different places for your control, like small, like big. Uh, RCPs is a class of its own and we mostly have this kind of form factor, but actually you could control your Red Komodo cameras from a rack unit if you wanted to. It's just very unusual. and. The Blue Pill is the platform that enables this because our long history of broadcast controllers has been based or is based on a platform which needs the power of Blue Pill to talk some of the most modern and amazing cameras we have on the market today. So this is what this one does, but the RCP Pro has it built in. So either this one and some of our, our other products or this one directly. So it's gonna be the same and we'll be focusing on the RCP Pro for this demonstration. I want to show you that we are already solving real world tasks with this solution. It's brand new. And the first shipment of RCPs actually um, ended up in a uh, church in LA. So um, share, um, I, I think you can see the pictures I have here on my screen. Here you see 10 RCP Pros installed at a Saddleback Church in, um, I think Orange County, about where James would be right now. And yeah, uh, they, mm -hmm. they have gone all in on a red Komodo workflow. So this is the control room, but just uh, check this one out. I need to, to find the, the other picture here because this is what they have spread across their auditorium. They have a super high-end zoom lens from Fujinon with all the broadcast controls you need. I, it's, it's a little bit like, like this lens. Um, this is a different um, uh, focal length but it's, it's the same features. It's a Fujinon highly professional lens with uh, the various jacks you can have for your uh, focus, um, uh, your uh, focus and your zoom controls for uh, on tripod controls, but the ability to control the iris of the lens from back in the control room. That's what the RCP does along with all the color controls that you find in the red cameras. So these lenses in various types are mounted on the red camera. On the back, they have a um, multi-dyne uh, silver back fiber converter to facilitate the signals going over fiber back to their control room. And then it appears they also have a monitor for the operators. So this is uh, what they have invested in to create a cinematic look for their productions in this church. And uh, James, uh, we, we just talked about that they have additional yep. advantages of this. Can, can you just comment on that? Yeah, so one of the additional advantages there, I think we showed maybe 10 RCP switchers there. Um, I believe they have 12 Komodos in total there. And some of those are in fixed positions like you just showed there with the larger pre-Mista lenses. And they do have gorgeous rear focus and zoom control, but maybe they wanna ha have someone be running around with a gimbal. Or maybe they wanna have something on a cable camera that can't be in that fixed position. And that's where they can either one, go wired into the connection or wirelessly still using that same RCP control. And I think that they there too was they solved a lot of things there, right? We saw fiber. So that's video and power going directly to the camera. They had tally going to the camera. They had all of that control. And I think the real benefit there is that some of those cameras 
actually come out of that live broadcast environment and go shoot their field operations and are able to reintegrate back in. And, and, and traditionally, you wouldn't want to touch those cameras because maybe there was so much to, to, to get them in and out of there. But really, I think that's the benefit of working with the Komodo or working with the Raptor. Look at all of these connections. It was primarily an ethernet into a USB-C dongle that was giving you that primary camera control mm -hmm. and something that they could very easily, you know, change position A to position B or C and really allowed for that flexibility and also repeats. And I know you said iris control, that's very important for Saddleback Church, gorgeous church that actually buttons uh, press and the doors open up on either side of the church. Also great for letting air through and things like that but that would change the dynamic range drastically. So they need to be able to not just shade the camera, but iris down. And by working with something like those Fujinon, system, Fujinon lenses there, they were able to get a nice complete package there where it all could be controlled from the, uh, from the main control room. That, that's actually a really good point. Uh, you're totally right that it is a kind of special uh, church, which is very, not very pretentious on, on the interior. It's, it's very open and they have all the, outdoor light floating in. So uh, what you will also see in my demonstration is how you can create scene files for your RCP. So you could also quickly switch multiple cameras uh, between white balances and so on. Uh, by the way, thanks to Amplio, the system integrator for sending us these photos. We are very happy that we are allowed to share them with you guys uh, today. Um, and it has been a lot of uh, fun working with you to set this one uh, up. There are some special workflows. If you want to know more details, you just contact us and we'll tell you. I think um, we should uh, s uh, stress one thing. What you see on the picture right now here is 10 RCPs controlling, you said 12 Komodo cameras. And I think that's the testimony to what you typically want to do. Typically with RCPs, you have one per camera, but you're not mm -hmm. limited to having only one per camera. In fact, uh, before we could have 10 RCPs, they needed to do away with three RCPs because we could not ship them all at, at, at once. And they could do so because we have a camera selector on the RCP. We'll get back to that. But the typical RCP workflow is that you will go for one RCP per camera, but the flexibility of the Skahoy RCP actually allows you to have one RCP being your master of all of them, maybe placed in a different room. Or like in this case, I could assume that uh, maybe the last two or three RCPs are dedicated to be flexible depending on which of the 12 cameras are in, uh, in use on that particular day where production is going on. I don't know the specifics of that, but there is a lot of flexibility because it's a multi-camera product. So um, that was a little bit of a use case from the real world. And um, then I would like to um, talk a little bit about the lenses first. Today, we will be looking at some Canon lenses which are not going to impress you. This is from my DSLR camera and it's a stepping iris and this one is not even controlled. but. The idea is that for real broadcast workflows, you are likely to put something else on and many different workflows exist to do that. So that's uh, kind of clear. But now let's look at the RCP V2 here right away. We have it um, connected to a Red Komodo camera here in the studio. And the main thing you notice about an RCP is this iconic joystick. And not only is it iconic to have what we call an iris joystick, this one is our own design and uniquely, I don't think anything like this exists in the world. We have a OLED display on the top that can show you information like the iris value of the camera. It could even be combined to also show you master black of the camera. We also have the classic ring here, which can be used to uh, uh, control master black on your cameras. And it also has a push function so you can activate a video router to bring your image up on a screen in front of you. All those classic um, advantages of an RCP joystick exist on the RCP Pro with this new and uh, highly innovative design that we have put out. This is a little tally LED, by the way, that sits up here. So that's absolutely a world first to, uh, to bring that out. So uh, you can see the picture from the uh, Red Komodo camera here. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there, there you go. So you can see as I'm pulling the handle, I'm also adjusting the iris of the lens on the camera. And the steps that you see on the iris is because the lens is uh, not stepless. On a true broadcast lens, you would have it differently. So it depends on the lens, but it shows you the f-stop value in the display. And as you can see, you have that critical lens control on the joystick. So that's like the most iconic feature you can mention about a RCP. 
Then we want to move on to color because there are um, both the white balance to consider, but there's also a number of color settings. So that means I want to explore the upper part of the RCP right here and explain you how this is laid out. So um, let me see, I think you have a pretty nice shot here. Um, on these buttons, we usually put in a menu system. So we are currently on the home menu and the home menu is actually an invitation to you to uh, put uh, your pr um, preferred features on the home screen. You, um, you can just continue with the selection that we have made for you. We have put a, a exposure adjustment. This is like an offset you can do to the image and you see the values are changing uh, right here on the display. We can, you can also adjust shutter speed. We have, um, sorry, shutter speed is over here, but ISO speed uh, on the camera with the values that Red are providing. We have the shutter speed here that we can set. And um, we can also press the shutter speed to get it in degrees instead. That's actually a very nice feature of the camera. We also have focus adjustment right question. here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have color temperature and then we have offset red, green, and blue. Now, if you're not happy with what we have put on the home screen, you can change it. So that's really uh, your decision. It, it's something you can do in the software. Um, but uh, we hope that the defaults we provide you will get you started in less than 10 minutes. So that's um, also our goal to present you meaningful presets. If we go to the exposure menu, you see some of the same stuff. You see exposure, ISO, shutter speed, and now you can actually adjust whether you want, uh, uh, sorry, uh, time or angle for your shutter. It is adjusted on this knob here. Um, and then we have additional settings up here like um, the iris as a redundant display of the iris because you can see as I'm moving the handle, I'm moving the handle right now, the iris value is actually changing. Um, okay, so then we have the color menu and there we have the offset uh, values. But if we go to color two, then we have power red, green and blue and slope red, green and blue. And this is all thanks to the CDL in the camera. I'm sure James wants to expand on that. but. Now, you either need to take my word for this or you um, want to see that it is actually uh, touching the camera image. So one thing we can show you is the camera image, but I also want to divert your attention to the web interface James has already shown to you. You know it. If you're a red user already, you know this web interface, you're familiar with it, and you are wondering how could I get a hardware controller for that? And that's exactly what we have made. And you will see that since if we browse down here, you see the ISO speed of the camera. And that's exactly what we had on the home screen. We have the ISO set to 1000 as I'm turning this knob, sorry, this one, then you see the ISO speed is changing immediately like on the web interface. And if you wonder, can I do it the opposite way around? Yes, you can. We can also set the shutter speed, or sorry, ISO speed um, to any value from the web interface and it's immediately reflected on the RCP. And um, that's of course a signature uh, critical workflow for any control system that you have a dual way uh, control. If it's changed by one master, it should be reflected on another one. We always go for that, what we consider the highest quality of control with the feedback and the multi-master uh, scenario. So um, that's that's what uh, we, we see right here. Now let's explore some of those uh, um, critical things like for instance, color temperature. And um, I think uh, we want to go to a screen like this. Now, on mm -hmm. the RCP, we have color temperature here in two modes. If I press this button on the RCP, you see that I am changing between having the color temperature in some presets, like uh, cloudy day, that seems to be LA this uh, particular Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have shade, we have, um, I think we have no more in that direction, but you see how the web interface is actually reflecting these values as I am going through them then the, the values you see in the web interface correspond to the presets that we are setting here. Now, if I press this button, we have kind of a dual mode. You are flipping in and out of either adjusting the color temperature. Notice that we can actually do it down to one Kelvin. And now you think, okay, so I need to, to turn this knob 1,600 times to bring it up to something higher. No, actually not, because we've been clever enough to integrate some kind of acceleration in many of the parameters. So it means that you can do super fine adjustments, but as you move the knob, quicker, you are browsing through the value range at a higher speed. I think that's, that's, that's one of the things that uh, we also proud about bringing out on this platform. And there's a lot of 
a opportunity to adjust it if, if you would not be happy with our settings. Um, also notice that this value is exactly the same in the web interface. Um, I, I find it very unusual for cameras to have this fine-grained color temperature control. I've, I've not seen it, I think, anywhere else than on your camera, James. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, just, just quickly here, we have also tint. Um, if we go to the color um, pages here, you see we have a, a parameter like tint we can move and I, you can see how this is moving along. So just quickly for you guys who know your, your RCPs, you will, uh, you will identify how we are able to, um, to adjust uh, these settings and see them immediately reflected like uh, ISO speed here again and the exposure adjustment value. If we scroll down, we have a lot. And, yep. Yep. Uh, you're, you're going right to where I was just going to say. You were showing some great, you know, video shading tools, which are very important on the broadcast side. But with our cameras being cinema cameras that are now being used in a broadcast space, you may come from that traditional workflow where you have a LUT, and you can go back to Casper's screen. There, he was just showing you where, you know, you're, you're controlling the, you know, the metadata or the um, ISO temperature exposure adjust. That's all metadata within Red, right there. What you can see mm -hmm. below that would your 3D LUTs, which are essentially something that sits on top of the raw file, does not affect the raw file, but in a broadcast sense, yeah, that's going to change my image out. So this is something where you can kind of get the best of both, right? You have your video controls or your metadata controls right there. You have your 3D LUT. If you have a show LUT or the church has a particular LUT that they really like, or that CDL or that color decision list. So back to just having multiple ways to get that same color that you're going for here. And I think that's why we have those extra controls. Some might say that it's too much, but you know, as a professional, you'd rather be able to control that than that to be hidden in something that you can't access. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, that's the reason for the design decisions you have done. And I think you have struck, uh, struck it pretty nicely between the, the two different workflows we are talking about here. And um, I, in, in the context of live production, the, uh, the way you would uh, be able to control the color on the RCP here, apart from color temperature, would be through using the CDL, which you would um, enable, disable here on this page on the RCP. And uh, if it's disabled, by the way, you see that the values are not uh, possible to adjust. Otherwise, you can simply adjust them by turning the knobs on um, for, for the offset values here. And uh, you can move on to, to the others and also turn the, them around. Now, uh, I'm probably messing up the image a little bit. Let's just see what ended up being the case here, because now I did this completely in the blind. Yes, absolutely ah. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, but this gives me a chance to actually press this button. And then we will see the images falling back to some preset that I have apparently stored. And that's what I mean by scene files. You see these buttons up here are eight banks of uh, presets that you can make for your camera. So just jumping in and uh, kind of displaying that right now, I just uh, pressed this button, which give us um, th this variant here. And then let's just uh, adjust this a little bit, um, turn some values around then. If we want to, um, and now I just want to make sure that you can see what is going on. Okay, so we are, we are here and then I press and hold this button. It lights up green. It means that it's saved right there. And now when I go between this one and this one, you'll see that it's recalling that. So that's the scene file. I absolutely over-exaggerated the scene uh, adjustments here to make it clear to you on the webinar that this is what you can do. But these uh, functions are available in the RCP and would be super useful in a church like Saddleback Church with that uh, light coming in where color-related yep. settings can be instantly recalled for the cameras in the room uh, when a cloud just uh, goes before mm -hmm. the sun and, and so on. Or, and, and, and just not in that same scene, but you know, there are different times in the production where maybe you're going to a musical part of the production, or maybe this is a speaking part of the production, right? They will actually want different looks and different frame rates to give a different look for maybe for the drum solo. So I was impressed there, Casper, at how quick that was, right? You were able to make that change for the camera. And this is something where you could easily change to camera two, and then camera one is switching between those presets. So you go right back and now you're in the black and white look or the moody look, or I think you were showing kind of maybe a, uh, a pastel Easter kind of purple look there. But once again, it was very easy to switch back between the two. And this is something that they can do as they're going from one camera to the other. And it's pretty instantaneous.
Absolutely. Okay, so I want to uh, just show a few more things, and then we want to hear a little more from uh, from James. Um, what I, I want to make sure is that you also understand we have some settings for audio. We can uh, actually control um, the audio source between none, external, internal. We are able to link and unlink left and right. We have audio gain uh, available on the RCP as well. You know them already. If you are into the cameras here, you know these features, definitely. And on the exposure um, menu, we also have um, some settings uh, up here. Um, I'm not sure what their full name are, but uh, you know these settings. Also from the web interface, let's just find that on the screen over here. So, um, and this is where it shows that I'm not the everyday user of this. But I think on this screen, you, you see some of these uh, settings. Like if we set this one to very soft, we see immediately that this setting is also reflected over here. So that should be no surprise to you guys. Now, one of the things that the, the broadcast users turned out to be happy to know was that we also have a record toggle button. So can we just get a snapshot of this on the controller? This button right here, if I press it, it will start recording on the media in the camera. And that's an essential feature as well. They, they had to ask us to make sure that it was there when they uh, engaged with us on, on this particular thing. And that's how Skyhoy often work. We will respond to the needs from the users in the field. So we are very much into, uh, into doing that. Also not to waste our resources on all the things that you don't need, but make sure that we can focus on those that you do need. Casper, um, can you... I stay real quick on that? Real yes. quick on that record feature right there. One key thing I want to show you there, you just hit record from the control room. If one of those cameras were a rover or maybe you were shooting something unscripted, Reds do have the ability to pre-record and that would be essentially ISO recording a small oh. portion that is, is essentially just dumping until you commit to it being a hard record. And essentially that pre-record could allow you to go around your event, wait for some bit of action to happen and Scarhoys are the best switchers and you're gonna be able to hit hard record again and keep that point. So it's a great way to have a soft initial record. And I'm pretty impressed that you showed that there because that's another thing where if you have that preset set up with the camera, you could go ahead and initial that pre-record. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm just going to stop it again because it will fill the media up without us noticing. So, um, um, but uh -huh. it's possible here and it's an essential feature in, in many workflows. So that's cool. Now we talked about, we, we've been looking at the Komodo and it's basically to say that the same things can be done on the V Raptor. So we have, we have also looked at the web interface of the Komodo right here. If I go to this tab in my web browser, uh, so maybe we'll see this, um, the web browser here. I have these two tabs. I can go to this tab and here we have the, um, the, the V Raptor camera. And um, so on this one, if I want to change over on the RCP, then I hold down the shift key and then I get access to my camera selector on the RCP. So let's just move this into position so you can see it up here. If my shift key on the RCP, as I'm holding the shift key on the RCP, let me see, okay. Um, I'm pressing the shift key, which is uh, down here. And that shift key basically substitutes my row of preset select buttons into a camera selector. So notice what happens in the display. I press this button and we now have V Raptor right there. All right, so wow. I'm now able to work on the V Raptor camera. And this is what they would do in Saddleback Church if they decided for a few of their RCPs to be flexible, to go to other cameras. They would just probably before the production go and configure this so the operator would have it all set up for the production and they could identify the cameras here but this is uh, how we can now uh, work with the the v raptor camera and in the web interface you can see simultaneously as i am adjusting the uh, iso speed you see the iso speed is changing now in the web interface as i'm turning the knob on the rcp so uh, there again you have confirmation that we are able to control the camera now i think you have already understood that so no reason to really show a lot more uh, on on that side of things but i want to say um that we have even more for you guys we have uh something pretty uh surprising surprising potential that we want to demonstrate at the end of the webinar uh, but before we get to that point i want uh, to hear a little bit from james to explain about your different cameras mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Casper. Well, I, I don't want to make this death by PowerPoint, but I just wanted to show one quick image here that really is just kind of going to help 
really give everyone a feel for all of our cameras, both our DSMC2s and now our brand new Ranger and Komodo. So Ranger and DSMC2 were our previous flagship cameras. You can see the modular DSMC2 as well as the full feature one body Ranger camera system here. These had several different lens options, but primarily in the chat today, we're gonna to be talking about the VRAP Moto. Both the V Raptor Moto are the cameras are going to work with the with the universal switchers here from Scarhoy, and I do want to point out that with Komodo, you do need that Komodo link adapter to give you that USB-C connection. I'll show you this live in just a second. But with V Raptor, it actually has a built-in USB-C connection as well as additional SDIs, two 12G SDIs, and so it is something where if I want to just go back to my camera in full here, this is something where in that scenario, whether it's Saddleback Church or another live event, I think when you showed the difference between your two cameras, it was the same interface, right? I got to see that one camera was recording in 6K while the other camera was recording in 8K, and really that gives you the ability to work with both full frame or super 35. It gives you the ability to work with maybe anamorphic lenses if you have the, the benefit to do so. And I wanna go ahead and switch back to my live view that was kind of similar to what Casper was showing you here, and Casper can get ready on his end. Now, check out what I'm gonna show you here. This is um, my live Raptor right here, and it is only being plugged in by that same USB-C to Ethernet dongle here. And I'm go ahead and just showing you that that is the only connection that's plugged into my camera. So very easy for myself or anyone on set to go ahead and connect that. And let me go ahead and get my frame nice and centered up here. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do here is uh, switch to my desktop view. And you're now seeing that live feed right out of the camera there. So let's go ahead and frame that back up here. And notice here that I have the IP address of the camera, the same IP address that, um, that both uh, Casper and Tyler were using a second ago. But if I did want the camera controls here, I'm just gonna delete that camera.9090 there. And what that's gonna allow me to do is get back to that camera control menu. I'm not gonna go ahead and do that. I'm just gonna go back into the dot And the really impressive thing here is look as I go ahead and switch my view, I'm gonna prove no hands here guys guys and gals you should be seeing me here no hands and casper can you go ahead and uh, control my camera for me because my hands are really busy doing the live stream casper is currently in denmark and and i had tyler do this earlier james but casper is going to go ahead yep. I, I want it, it's so it's it's fun to see you with your hands up because you will be held up by by me for a moment since i want to show people how we do connect to you so uh oh, okay. thanks <laughs> But uh, that was a little, we'll do it again. no, no worries. Uh, actually on my screen, let's just go to my screen because what we want to see here is that the same web interface of the uh, uh, Komodo camera in, um, what was it? V-Raptor. That's a V-Raptor. Ah, it was your right V-Raptor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have, to, you you have so many cameras. Up, you can see eight cat. Yep, you can see it right yeah. there. All right, sorry about that. But hey, uh, it's the same camera interface. We have access over a VPN from Copenhagen to LA to control this camera. What I want to show you now is that it doesn't have to be only the web browser because James would tell you about the flexibility of using the web browser or the iPhone, but you can also have your RCP control. And how easy would it be to add this camera to the workflow? That's what I will show you right now. And then you will see that I should be able to control his camera back there with those two nice skulls next to the color chart. So um, the um, software platform you find inside RCP Pro and the blue pill is called Reactor. It has an almost as cool name as a red product. Um, and in here, we can add more devices. You already find that the RCP Pro is identified here. We also have the two cameras, which are locally with me in Copenhagen. But now I want to add a new device. So I will uh, add this manually and I will make a search for Raptor. Just type in a few letters from the name and we pick it right here, add this device, and then it's currently unknown what the status is or we should actually be disconnected. And we are, but now I will type in the IP address that I know is in fact the IP address of the camera from up here. So there we go, 180. Thank you. I don't think we need any more than that. And uh, as we now, yep, there you go. The camera in Los Angeles is actually connected right now. They are all three connected. 
there is another step we need to do because the way our controllers work, you can add a ton of devices. You could also add video switches, video routers and so on, and they wouldn't be cameras. So these are cameras and it means that apart from the RCP having a connection network wise to the camera, we need to add it to our camera selector. And the camera selector was the buttons on the upper row, which we access by the shift key. So I'll now go to mapping and I'll click my camera selector here. And you see a nice little table where clicking this will give me access to adding a, a third camera. So I'll write V Raptor LA. And then I will uh, scroll to the side and over here, I will pick a configuration. Now you see a lot of configurations which are, which are not relevant to us, but you also see some that talks about red. So you can actually, we, we currently have only one that really makes sense, which is our primary configuration. But you can imagine that by, by time, we might have multiple configurations that would serve slightly different purposes or approaches to, to shading layouts. And we, we will see a library of those grow then we'll also choose a way we can handle iris. This may seem redundant to you, but it really isn't because today we will control the lens at James place through the V Raptor itself. But in Saddleback Church, they had a Fujinon lens, which were connected in a different route back to the control room through RS232 over the fiber bag. Actually, it never did anything that put a great image into the a Komodo camera, and then it would be controlled by different means. On the Skahoy RCPs, these are merged together. You don't have a chasm between different technologies. We can merge it into a single unified experience. This is why we um, would uh, or could have had to choose a different iris channel for how we control the lens itself. So enough, enough talking. Now, uh, actually, this is all we need to do. There's not even a save button. So all I need to do now to see if this works is to hold down my shift key. And now we can see up here we have a, a third button light up. And as I select this one, we see also that the display changes to V Raptor LA. And now, James, I'm really excited to can, can I see your hands up again? Come on. Hands up. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay, so now I'm no pulling hands, the handle. Mom, I promise. And, uh, and I really hope we are seeing stuff in the background. We are seeing it behind you. As I'm pulling the handle, we are seeing the picture is changing. And now I'm doing it a little bit quicker. So you get an, there's definitely a lag when you do this across the, uh, the punt like this. Um, especially if we are sitting here in Denmark and we need video coming back to us, you, you probably want to, to consider the latency of the signal. But in terms of control, this is just rock solid. So everyone, what we are essentially doing right now is controlling a camera from Copenhagen and the cameras in LA. And let's just do a few color things as well. And I'm gonna mess it up for you so that we can really see something. Uh, let's also create a preset, why not? So now I made a preset right there and now I'm gonna do something else which is horrible and put it into another preset. And then I'm going to change between these two presets and uh, we'll see, okay, it was a tiny change on the red, but you can all see what we are talking about here in mm -hmm. terms of control. Um, yeah. And Casper, while you're doing that, I'm holding up my iPhone or my Android device, which every operator should have, and right, keep making those changes. I'm seeing the changes here on my end, and there is such thing as too many cooks in the kitchen when we are in production. There should only be one person shading or controlling the camera, but maybe you're away from your desk and I need to switch this back to the preset we were on. I'm using now my phone as the vehicle to switch back to my preset. And essentially, if I hit apply here, that's gonna go ahead and change the preset that I was previously on. And you guys and gals saw that live, right? I used my phone to control that. And if we go back to um, Casper controlling that, once again, we're just showing multiple ways at how we could get back to the standardized shot or look that we were going for here. And I think that's really the benefit here. We talked about different budgets, different workflows, different capabilities here, and really whether you have one switcher or like what we recommend, one for every camera or one for that dedicated purpose here, you're seeing how you have that control across all of these platforms. Same parameters, same consistency, and really that's what's gonna allow you to keep your production looking that much better on going forward. That's true. I think we want to take in some questions very soon, but Tyler, what about the poll? Should we take a look at that? Absolutely. I didn't even have to yell. Um, 
So our first question was, have you worked with Scarhoy products before? And 73% of attendees said yes, which is a great number. Now, the second question, are you a current red owner? Only 20% said yes and 80% said no, but I think that might change after this webinar. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. the third question, what is your background? 53% of people said broadcast, only 7% said cinema, and 27% said all of the above, which just goes to show how products these days are being integrated in all sorts of new ways, and Scarhoy and Red are really pushing the boundaries of what you can do with broadcast. Now, the final question, how would you describe yourself? 73% of people said they were a reseller or an integrator, which is fantastic, very popular question. Very few end users and no others. Oh, so only inside the industry stuff here. Now, mm -hmm. if we go into our chat, everybody, please feel free to ask as many questions as possible. But we'll start with the question from Asi Lane. Uh, do you plan to either support Ranger protocol or update Ranger protocol or update Ranger support to new protocols, Casper? Okay, I, I, um, actually, I don't fully understand the product uh, or the question, sorry uh, about that, uh, but James, I, maybe you do. I think, I think we talked a little bit about this, Casper, and we can talk about it. So when we talk about our DSMC2 cameras, digital still motion cameras, I'm holding up a Scarlet W. This is a same DSMC2 body and camera as the Ranger that they were just asking about there. Now, those cameras are on RCP1, Komodo, Raptor, and eventually Raptor XL are on RCP2. So based on our conversations earlier, Casper, I think we mentioned that, uh, talked about how maybe Scarhoy has a, a different protocol or a different switcher that might work with our legacy cameras. Unfortunately, there is no way to go back and update the protocol on the legacy cameras. They are on RCP1. I think the really beautiful benefit here is that all RED cameras, including back to our inception, recorded to RED code or red's proprietary color science that allows us to get 16-bit raw. So even if you have to use a different controller, or maybe you're only using the SDI or the monitor out of that other red camera system, you're still gonna be able to match the look. We talked about getting the CDLs, the LUTs, everything to match. That's the look of your church or your production. You can go ahead and ensure that you're matching that across all red cameras. However, I wanna be really clear here, from all of the controllers and the blue pills that we talked about, and Casper, you can confirm this, it is the RCP2-based RED cameras, which would be Komodo and V-Raptor. And V-Raptor XL will be something that'll be coming out in 2022. And based off of everything we've talked about thus far, that camera would also be on RCP2. So I hope I answered that question correctly. Yeah, I, I, I think you do. And on our side, it is true that this is an implementation of the uh, RED RCP2 protocol and it has been optimized for the two models on the table right here and it will also be for the model james is mentioning coming out in 22. the um, rcp1 protocol does exist on our unisketch um uh, rcps but it is um it is we are considering it legacy and it needs some more care to to really work but what i'm hearing is that this question makes some people excited about broadcast workflows because it is made so much more relevant with these two new cameras. And as you do that, you want to, to also move your older uh, uh, red cameras into that production. And I fully understand that. It means that suddenly that could be a renewed reason to consider implementing fully the the rcp1 protocol that uh, older cameras support. So um, it's not... Um, it's something that the the right answer is please get in touch with us because it is something that we might want to work with you on making happen mm -hmm. and, and and if someone wanted a one-on-one -on -one from a red side on just how you would maybe potentially color match or make a preset work from one of your old cameras to your new cameras i want to be very clear i'm holding up the red control app which is works with rcp2 we had a previous app that came through our partner called Full Control, F-O-O-L. Full Control is RCP1. There is no way to make Full Control work with Red Control. That's just trying to reiterate the point there. They are two different protocols, but remember, they all record to Red Code. They all use CDLs, LUTs, and Red Code 16-bit color science. So yes, either work with us at Red. Matthew, Frank in the chat could definitely take your information one-on-one, -on -one, and we can help you with those Red presets. And if you had questions on the 
controller side, that's where you're working with Casper and Tyler and team. At the end of the day here, we want you to be able to control those cameras and get the overall look that you need. Great answers, guys. Great work. Uh, next question is from Daniel. Can we also change the output setting from the RCP of the Komodo or Raptor to output full menu on screen on the SDI out and use the RCP to go through the menu functions if needed? I, um, that, yeah. That would, you, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead from Catherine. the RCP side, um, I believe that these functions are not implemented. We do not have. Um, we have not implemented navigation of the menu in the red camera from the RCP or the uh, output delegation you're mentioning. Um, I am not sure if this is a design choice uh, or like we did not implement it or if the RCP2 protocol does not allow for it. But I can tell you that just like one of our early adopters came to us and said, hey, can you also implement the record button? Because that's super useful to us. We did, because it was possible. So this is once again something that we, we kind of drive it to a certain point where we say, hey, this is enough to make a webinar and pitch it to you guys. And at this point, we need to know how do you respond to it? What is further useful to you? And then we will take that into our roadmap. And quite often, it's something that we can react upon quickly as well and, and i don't know if you guys are seeing my screen right now but i went back into the desktop interface and i know casper showed how this worked very well in tandem with the controller and notice i went to menu monitoring sdi right that's just coming through the menu right here and notice i can change the monitor output i can i think the question was on whether you wanted the menus here so that's whether or not you want an overlay if I click that on, now you are seeing the menus. And this is where you can select both a advanced or simple menu out. And with red cameras, it, the analogy comes up, it's kind of like plumbing. If you're wondering why your SDI out has a look or has a menu on it, then you gotta go to your SDI on the monitoring tab. Same thing for your LCD. Each monitor output has a different control and that's where you would just wanna make sure you're controlling the correct one. All right. That's great. Good to know. Great information, everybody. The next question comes from Finn. This is one that's going to be for you, James. He says, hi, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if it was on Red's Horizon to support higher frame rate output at 4K resolutions over SDI with a future camera or a current camera at, for example, 4K at 200 frames per second over quad link 12 GSDI or 100 frames with dual link 12 GSDI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I'd, I'd love to be able to give you more information on that, but I will know that I've worked at Red for 10 years, and I know that I'm the one that talks about existing products, things that are out, making sure everyone is aware of it. If you're asking about future products, future features, I would encourage you to follow Jared Land, our president. He likes to talk about future cameras, things that are coming out. I really am going to be talking about what the current capabilities are. Now, out of the Raptor, you do have increased frame rate abilities. I want to be clear. Raptor is the camera that is a high frame rate camera, 8K 120, 4K 300, uh, 2K 600 frames per second. But typically in a broadcast sense, and this is where I'll lean back on you guys, what are we asking for on broadcast? It's typically 60P, 2398, or maybe 25, depending on where we are in the world. Um, it, it's definitely something that Red has always listened to our customer. And if there is a big request, that's where we have things like feature requests, and you can always reach out to myself. But once again, I won't be able to talk about future camera stuff. I would encourage you to follow Jared Land, our president. He likes to share uh, uh, what's coming out in the, with the next camera systems. That's great. And we look forward to all of the new RED releases that I'm sure will be 1,000 frames per second at 50,000. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, one day, eventually. Promised by Scar Horror, right. not promised by James Red, <laughs> yeah. right? Now. I want to make that very clear. Yeah, here. you yeah. can reach you can yeah, you can reach me at Tyler at Scarhoy.com for all future yeah. red uh just kidding. Uh okay, last question it seems. Sorry, James, continue. No, that, that's it. Go ahead, next question. Okay, next question from Andrew. It looks like one RCP can control both Red Komodo and potentially another vendor's camera like a Panasonic or Sony PTZ, which is great for mixed workflows. However, in legacy systems, it's likely that proprietary IP controlled RCPs 
from Panasonic or Sony already exist? Is it possible to take their output and translate it to RED to allow hybrid control of both RED and Panasonic or Sony cameras with the Panasonic or Sony RCP? Sounds that's like a question, a for, question me. for you, Casper. <laughs> Uh, of course, that's not possible if you want to use the legacy RCPs. What is possible is that you buy the Skyhoy RCP and it does both for you. So that's what I'm inviting you to. Yeah, that's kind of the answer. Um, it, it wouldn't be something that comes out of our labs. We are in the business of making the uh, control products for you uh, in the future. I do realize that a lot of OB trucks would have lined up Sony RCP 1500s in there. But many of these are getting challenged. I mean, there are many of our other partners as well who are not able to um, to match their RCPs, uh, sorry, their cameras up with the functionality of these legacy RCPs which are around. So I think we'll see a big shift away from those into an RCP product like this one that has the multi-camera support that is really necessary for the future workflows. So, um, yep, that's why we are here. And, and I will say from a red standpoint, I, I know that maybe in the past it wasn't it was hard to find some of this information. I want to go ahead and just share my desk right now. Um, we've talked about LUTs, we've talked um, operation guides. Just know that if you maybe did want to go ahead and do that, we do provide our SDK right here on our downloads page. And that is something where, once again, I would always recommend using the Scarhoy switcher because we always saw how easily it was to select multiple different cameras. I understand that there are productions that don't have just all one camera system. I saw in Casper's menu there how you could select a number of different cameras and kudos to you guys for programming in all those other cameras. But if someone else wanted to do that, there is the SDK. That information is not hidden. It's not gobbledygook. You just have to go out there and be willing to program it. And thank you to Scarhoy for doing that because your product is excellent working with all of our new cameras here. So thank you again. Thanks, James. Um, let me just quickly show how this would actually look. I mean, if you can, uh, let me see, check out uh, our screen here. Yes. Um, then we are currently looking at the 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 three um, uh, two uh, different models of red cameras. We um, they are both supported by something we call a device core called Red RCP2, and this is what we selected when we went into devices to add a new device. Then uh, we are searching up devices right here. Uh, if I search for Red, you'll see that we have like a generic model. We have these two, and they are served by the same piece of, of software. Let's search for a, a PDC camera. So, you, for instance, you see that we have a lot of models from Panasonic that we can uh, go with. Uh, we have Visca cameras, uh, a lot of those as well. And so on. Let's just pick one of the Panasonic cameras because I think uh, we'll see more and more uh, PDC cameras introduced on the market uh, in a mixed workflow like this. So um, now that we have pulled this up, if I click here for uh, the device core of the Panasonic cameras and I click manual, you will get to a PDF file that essentially shows you the multitude of parameters that are supported in our system for your uh, Panasonic. And now I'm only halfway through the list, not even. So this is uh, basically every single parameter that Panasonic has put out for their PDC cameras are uh, uh, supported for a number of different models. You, you you could take something like Gamma Type and you see that it seems like it's different depending on model. And yes, that is true. It is different depending on model. And the models that we support are those that you see up here, which are basically the whole range. And this is true for Visca cameras. This is true for other types of cameras that we are supporting and um, it, it's also a way for you to explore how the red integration actually uh, you see we have two models we have the komodo we have the uh, v raptor um, lined up here and if we browse through the list you can see most parameters turns out to be the same it's it's the same settings we have for the audio source on, on these two and uh, then we, we scroll down and we realize that on a particular point apparently which is called highlight roll-off there are different settings according to the implementation we have made so on the Komodo we see these values while on the Raptor we see these we could even test it so if we uh, go to our um, to the um, highlight roll-off we are now on the Komodo so we see in the display here I don't know if we can get that on the screen can we um, so up here in the display, I'm now 
choosing between the the values that we uh, we had for the Komodo, going from very soft to soft to medium to hard to to none. But now I'm changing over to the Raptor camera. And now in the same list here, we should see different values. Mm -hmm. We see four different values. And those are the values that are listed for this one. So you see how and clever are, this is made. Mm -hmm. And those are very, very key for when your director or your creative director is saying, hey, make it, make it very soft and creamy or make it really punchy or all these adjectives that don't really mean anything punchy, splashy, this. <laughs> The key there is you can match those across the red cameras. I think the challenge does come when you start doing multiple cameras, we grade to the lowest denominator. And I think when you work with the red camera system, you're getting all of that benefit of 16 bit raw. And when we go to some of these churches like that, um, like the one that we mentioned there with uh, Saddleback Church and Amplio Systems, the really crazy color, the teals, the blues, these colors that are really hard, challenging colors for maybe other cameras, on the reds, it matches them perfectly, and they're showing it there in less than one frame latency. So if you are watching it live, hey, the drum solo has all of the vibrant colors, and we're watching it there in real time. Now, when you try and do the highlight roll off of that of another camera system, that's where staying within the red ecosystem is best because that's all working with our SDK and our red code. Um, you can't necessarily use red presets on other camera systems. It, it doesn't quite work that way. You would want to go ahead and work with that manufacturer and create your own preset. Thank you, James. And um, I, I totally agree that if, if you can have a workflow with the same type of cameras, then often that's what you would prefer. But you know that best yourself, planning your integrations. What I want to highlight is that when we dedicate to support something like RED, we are not going for the common uh, or lowest common denominator. Between the two mm -hmm. cameras we've been looking at today, we are identifying what is the same and what is different. And the things that are different are also presented to you differently. And I think this is a unique thing for Skyhoy because many generic products you find out there, they would instead create a menu of uh, roll off options that would have to include everything because they are not aware mm -hmm. that they are connected to the one or the other camera. But as you can see, we are in the business of giving you a native control experience mm -hmm. for the gear that you are connecting mm -hmm. to our controllers. And that has been fine tuned on the Blue Pill platform. Do we have more questions, Tyler? Or we are, because we are really at the end of the webinar, but um... we do. We do have more questions um, right. if you guys are willing to answer them. Absolutely, we are. But I, I, I also usually tell people thank you for joining our webinar and uh, just make sure that you um, that we kind of round it up because we we want to do this in one hour. We are now five minutes past, but we also like to just keep going for for as long as it takes to interact with you guys so we are very thankful for your questions and and so on but if you need to leave then thank you for hanging out with us both james and i and our teams are ready to interact with you so and thank you james officially uh, here um in in the official um uh, closing of of the show so um thanks for having us Yep, you're welcome. But let's go back to Tyler and hear what more questions we have we could uh, work with. Yeah, so Ramiro asks, what is the output latency on the SDI for the Raptor camera? Oh, great, great question. Um, it is something that with Genlock, we're talking uh, l less than a frame um, or about one, one frame latency. Without Genlock, it's going to be a little bit greater than that. I don't have the exact stat right up here in front of me. Let me give me one second here while I pull that up. Um, give me one more second here. And I want to get this exact. Thank you for bearing with me here, guys. And uh, why don't we move on to the next question? I'm going to pull up that exactly here. So I, I don't want to misrepresent that here. Oh, no, of wait, I got it. I got um, it right here. Oh. I thought I had it. So um, <laughs> here we go. So I'm actually going to go ahead. I know this was on Raptor, but I want to go ahead and give you um, just basically that the SDI connection is uh, one frame delay. And with Genlock, it can be like three to four frames without. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. If you were shooting, let's say, something like uh, uh, 6K24, it might be something like uh, 41.6 milliseconds. If you were to do something like 4K60, 
it might be something like 16.6 milliseconds. So when you're changing your frame rates and changing your resolution, that may change it slightly. But once again, when we're talking less than one frame here, right, uh, with Genlock, definitely something here that, like I was saying, we could do that live broadcast in that church and then see the drummer doing the drum solo. And it was something that wasn't off-putting. It was something, like I said, that was about a frame with Genlock. And really, your, your naked eye, it was pretty much indiscernible. Saddleback Church does have, like many big churches, uh, live LED screens for display in their auditorium. And um, I, I was actually there last Sunday uh, to visit them when I was in LA and see the whole installation. And it was just flawless. It was so amazing. The, the whole setup was amazing, but there was absolutely nothing to, to criticize the quality of video or the latency for. So you can, no question, you can use this in in uh, iMac uh, workflows where you yeah put your your live image on a big screen absolutely um so one more question it seems andrew asks can you go through the physical physical connectivity for the komodo control and something like a standard v4 mount fujinon lens mm -hmm. yes um this this lens is um it's a fujinon lens that has both the standard before connector right here so it is made for broadcast cameras while i i know the lens they used um in the saddleback church project was a pl mount lens it also has the digital um 20 pin connector right here which is what we use if we um like in saddleback church we actually control the lens fully digitally over rs232 through the fiber back if you had a before lens situation and the red camera does not have a before lens connect on it, you need a different product from Skyhoy called Ethernet Before Link. What it does is basically insert a little blue box between this plug and your Ethernet cable. And yeah, so on the other side, 80 uh, millimeters further out here, you would have an Ethernet plug, PoE, and then you would have power and control of your lens. I hope that answers the question. And then from a red standpoint, when anytime someone's asking about what's red approved, how would I work with this other mount battery media, so forth, I think it's really nice. I'm going to switch my screen here. You're going to see my desktop here. I went to the red approved third party page. This is just red.com third party accessories. And you can select both from V Raptor to Komodo. And you were asking about lens adapters. So these are the ones that are red approved. Notice there's a difference between red approved and red compatible. Notice there's additional compatible mounts that aren't red approved. And the difference there is the red approved ones are gonna be the ones that are gonna communicate. They're gonna have the pins that allow for that information to come through to the camera. Um, those are the companies and manufacturers that are working with red and where our product team. So I would always go to those mounts first and do know there's a list of incompatible products too that I would wanna make sure that I double check first before you go ahead and integrate something into your camera that might potentially cause damage. We list that pretty clearly right there on that third party page. Cool. Of course, that's great info. So that's all the questions right now, guys. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Tyler. I think that's it. And thanks to everyone thank you, who, everyone. Um, who uh, uh, hung out with us this far into the webinar. It has been a pleasure serving you with uh, these amazing cameras and the content uh, around them, our RCPs. And uh, once again, don't hold back. If you have questions, then shoot them off to our teams and they'll be happy to interact with you.